Hello and welcome to our UTME prep series. So this is the final part of the solutions to the structured question for physics 2020. Before we continue, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like and share our content. And you can also visit our website at scholar.com to practice UTME for free and uh, modular quizzes. The next question is on magnetism. A magnetic needle is suspended first at the Earth's north magnetic pole and then at the point on the magnetic equator. The respective angles between the needle and the horizontal are okay so at the north pole the north pole is completely in the vertical okay the angle is going to be 90 degree okay the angle would be 90 degree while at the equator which is in the horizontal which is in the horizontal the angle would be a zero degree that is if the needle is lying in the equator okay then the angle between the needle and the equator is going to be zero degree if it is lying in the horizontal so we have 90 degree and zero degree question 23 a ideometer is an instrument for measuring the so the ideometer is used to measure the relative density of a substance or the density question 24 is on resolution of vectors it says consider the three forces acting at zero and in equilibrium as shown in this figure here which of the following equations is or are correct so if we resolve this forces right if we resolve this in the horizontal then we are going to have since the angle of inclination is to the horizontal then we'll be using cos so resolving this in the horizontal is going to give us p1 cos theta 1 that is the horizontal component of the force p1 is going to be p1 cos theta 1 that of the force p2 is going to be p2 cos theta 2 now since this body is in equilibrium then the force that is acting in this direction that is this p3 must be equal to the sum of the horizontal components of this force in this direction that is the force in this direction p3 must be equal to the sum of the horizontal component of this force in this direction that means that p3 must be equal to p1 cos theta plus p2 cos theta so what we have here ii is correct but what we have here that p1 sine theta 1 is equal to p1 cos theta 2 um this is not correct okay this is not so and the second one that unless 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 your um, theta 2 plus theta 1 is equal to 90 degree unless theta 2 plus theta 1 is equal to 90 degree and there's nothing here to suggest that so we cannot make that assumption then that p1 sine theta 1 is equal to p2 sine theta 2 is wrong that is we're saying that the vertical component of this is equal to the particle component of this and there's nothing here to suggest that so the correct option here is this that is the force in this direction is equal to the sum of the horizontal component of these forces in the other direction all right next question is on light ray the refractive index of a liquid is 1.5 if the velocity of light in a vacuum is 3.0 if the velocity of light in a vacuum is 3.0 times 10 raised to the power 8 meters per second, the velocity of light in the liquid is. So, since the light ray moves from vacuum to um, to the liquid, then we say that the refractive the refractive index of the light will be equal to the speed of that light in the vacuum over the speed of the light in um, in the liquid. So we have the refractive index N as 1.5. This is equal to the speed in the vacuum, which is 3 times 10 raised to the power 8, divided by speed in liquid. So what we're looking for is, here is the velocity of the light or the speed of the light in the liquid. So if we cross multiply, let's denote the velocity of the speed in liquid as VL. If we cross multiply this, then we're going to be having 1.5 VL equals 3 times 10 raised to the power 8 meters per second. So to get the value of um, the velocity of uh, of the light in the liquid, we divide both sides by 1.5. So we have 3 times 10 raised to the power 8 divided by 1.5. 3 divided by 1.5 will give you 2 times 10 raised to the power 8 meters. Okay, we have a question on sound wave. 
a ship traveling towards a cliff receives the echo of its whistle after 3.5 seconds a short while later it receives the echo after 2.5 seconds if the ship if the speed of sound in air under the prevailing conditions is 250 meter per second how main how much closer is the ship to the cliff okay so um if you notice in this question here um the first time the echo is he had the echo in 3.5 seconds the echo what we call echo is the sound that is produced from the reflection of sound that is um for example you may you may have found yourself in a situation where you are in an ex enclosed place okay and then you scream for example you shout and after some time you are going to hear that same sound again maybe like seconds after you hear that sound again as if somebody is imitating you so that sound that you're hearing is what we call an echo now if you look at this question the first echo that i heard was 3.5 seconds after the whistle then later he had an echo 2.5 seconds now the thing is the father or the father that is alpha the father the person is from that reflecting surface okay so let's say we have somebody here now who is making a sound that sound is going to travel to this let's say this is a surface then that sound will be reflected back to that person now the further that person is from that reflecting surface the longer the time that it will take for that person to hear the echo so um when when he had this echo like 3.5 seconds you see the time here is greater than the time here which means that here he was far away like farther okay from that um source from from that reflecting surface now that he's hearing the echo like 2.5 seconds that means that he's now closer to that surface like to to that cliff okay so what we want to calculate here is how much closer is he to the cliff that is how much distance did he move okay um such that he's hearing the echo like you know um one second earlier you know he was hearing a 3.5 before now he's hearing 2.5 so like one second earlier that's what we are trying to calculate now um so the velocity of sound even given all you know, the speed of sound here has 250 meter per second what we are going to do here is we are going to take the difference in the time okay the difference in the time within between which he had he had that echo so that's 3.5 seconds minus 2.5 seconds and we have one second then let the dis the difference in the distance between the cliff okay let us say the distance okay between the cliff between that ship and the cliff at this time was d1 okay and this answer is d2 so the difference will be like d2 minus d1 so let's just represent that d2 minus d1 that's difference in distance by this capital letter d here. okay now next um for an echo sound okay when in, in an echo the distance that will be traveled is two like two distance meaning let's say a person is standing here and that person shouts so the sound is going to move like a distance d to the surface and another distance d back to that person before the, for that person to hear that echo so it is two distance that we have here so velocity normally is supposed to be or speed is supposed to be distance over time but here are using 2d because that sound is traveling two distance okay so we have the velocity of sound or the speed of sound to be equal to two times the distance between the ship and the cliff divided by the difference in the time so you have this as 250 is equal to 2d divided by 1 when you cross multiply this one here you're going to have 250 times 1 is equal to 2d that is 2d is equal to 250 divide both side by 2 and we are going to have d to be equal to 125 meter okay so 125 meter that is the correct um option here another way you could have also calculated this is you can use this formula here to calculate the distance with this 3.5 seconds using the time taking the time to be 3.5 seconds then you also calculate the distance again taking the time to be 2.5 seconds then you take the difference between both distances okay you can also do that so you, take, you just take the difference between both distances and um you'll be getting the same um answer next question on optics which of the following statement about defect of vision is or are correct so a person that has long sightedness or called hyper uh, metropia, close objects are going to be blur what this means is that that person will be able to see distance object objects that are far away they'll be able to see it very well but they will not be able to see close objects to appear blur and the, the reverse is also true for a person who is short-sighted they'll be able to see things that are close you know very well but they cannot see far object or distance objects very well and short sight is corrected using a pair of this is wrong 
okay we use a converging lens the converging lens is also known as a convex lens we don't use the convex lens in correcting short-sightedness the convex lens or converging lens is used to correct long-sightedness while the concave lens or what is called the diverging lens is what is used to correct short-sightedness so the statements that are correct here is i and i i next question on optics the question is which of the following conditions are necessary and sufficient for total internal reflection to take place at the boundary between two optical media that is two media that allow for light to pass through so for total internal reflection to occur okay there are two conditions that are required number one is that the light that light must be traveling from a denser medium okay from, from a medium that is more dense oh, or a denser medium to a medium that is less dense for example let us say between water and air you know water is a liquid and liquid generally they are denser than gases air is just a mixture of gas so water is denser than air so when you have light moving from water for example into air that is going from a denser medium to a less dense medium then we can have total internal reflection another condition for it is that the angle of incidence that is the angle of incidence at this point here okay the angle between the this is the incident ray now okay this is the incident ray the angle between the incident ray and the normal which is what we call the angle of incidence must be greater than the critical angle okay so from these options here um it must be traveling from an optically denser medium to an optically less dense that is correct like from um say from glass to water for example or from water to air or from glass to air so that is correct um but from a less dense to an optically denser no this is wrong next angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle that is correct as you can see here and um, this is wrong so we have i and i i i that's option yeah, this option right here i and i i i we have a website at scholar.com where you could practice exams for free the UTM exam and the post exam it also features modular quizzes in physics chemistry and biology so if you've studied a topic in any of the subjects and you want to test your understanding of the topic you can head on to our website at scholar.com and take modular quizzes for free also if you sign up on the website it has a personalized dashboard where you could use to check your progress in learning we also have interactive sessions on the website and on our social media uh, platform freebies are also available to top performance on the website next on expansivity question is the linear expansivity of brass is 2 times 10 raised to the minus 5 per celsius if the volume of a piece of brass is 15 centimeter at 0 degree celsius what is the volume at 100 degree celsius so before we even start calculating one thing that i want us to note here is that um generally this brass for example is a solid and generally solids when they are heated they expand the original temperature here is, is zero degrees celsius and the new temperature is 100 degrees celsius that means that the volume of this you know brass must have expanded um excuse me this is supposed to be centimeter cube okay since we are talking about volume here okay it should be in cube okay so that means that now um based on what i've just said now that when you eat a solid or a liquid it expands okay so it is expected that the new volume at this higher temperature is going to be larger than this original volume so if there's any of this option here where we have a volume that is less than this then that cannot even be our answer so we can eliminate that and here we don't have any of those options so we really need to calculate here to know what is the new volume all right so the formula for volume expansivity is gamma here which represents volume expansivity is equal to the change in the volume okay the change in the volume divided by the original volume times the change in temperature now the first thing we need to do here is let us calculate the change in volume for example you know the original volume is 15 centimeter cube if i know that the change in the volume is let's say one centimeter cube now that means that the new volume is going to be this initial volume the original volume plus that one so it's now be 16 centimeter cube so that's what we are trying to do here let us find the original volume then the change in the volume first so it is that change that we then add to the original volume to get the new volume so but in this question you can see that this gamma here 
I, like I said, represents volume expansivity. But from here, we've not been given volume expansivity. So what do we do? Now, volume expansivity is equal to three times the linear expansivity, which is what we've been given in the question. They give us the linear expansivity. So with this linear expansivity that we've been given, we can get the volume expansivity. Okay? So we simply multiply this by three. Alright? So this times three, we have six times ten raised to the power minus five. So this is the cubic expansivity or the volume expansivity. We can then substitute that back into this formula here. Remember we got this formula from here. By making this thing here the subject of the formula when you cross multiply this. Okay? So we can now use this formula. We then say that the change in volume is equal to this, the volume expansivity, which is six times ten to the power minus five, multiplied by the original volume, which is fifteen point zero zero, that's just fifteen centimeter cube, then times this delta t delta t here is the change in temperature. Okay? So that will be this new temperature, 100 degrees Celsius, minus the original temperature. So here we have 100. So we have 90 times 10 raised to the power 5 times. Now this 100 here, like 100 minus 1 is 100. We've written it as 10 raised to the power 2. 10 raised to the power 2 means 10 times 10. That is 10 multiplied by itself, like, you know, 2 times. Okay? So 10 times 10. So that's 10 raised to the power 2. The reason why I put it this way is so that we can easily use the law of indices on these two here. And what is that law? Is that when you are multiplying two numbers like this that have the same base okay that have the same base what do we do we just take that common base which is here yeah, is 10 then since this is multiplication we are going to add the power if it is division we will subtract so we are going to add the powers minus 5 plus 2 so here we have 90 times 10 raised to the power minus 3 now 10 raised to the power minus 3 means 1 over 10 raised to the power 3 that's mean of 10 raised to the power minus 3 1 over 10 raised to the power 3 and 10 raised to the power 3 is 1000, meaning 10 times 10 times 10, that's 1000. So 1 divided by that 1000 is what will now give us this is 0 0.001. I hope this is clear. If it's not clear, you can try to write down um, some of these things that I'm saying. Okay, some steps have been um, skipped here. So, like we're writing this as 1 over 1000. So you can just write it somewhere and put it into perspective. Okay. So here we have 90 times 0 0.001, and that will give us 0 0.09. Now that we know this, so that is a change in the volume, okay? So like I said, in order for us to now get the new volume, we will now add the change in volume to the original volume, okay? So the original volume was 15, then we add this is 0 0.09 to it, and we have 15.09 centimeter cube. So this will be the new volume of that brass at this 100 degree Celsius. That is 15.09 centimeter cube. Next question on heat calorimetry. The lower and upper fixed points marked on the mercury in glass thermometer are 200 millimeter above the lower fixed point in a room. What is the temperature of the room in degree Celsius? So this is a question on temperature um, measurements. And for questions like this, okay, what we do is uh, what we call interpolation. Okay, what, what are we doing here is basically we take the difference in the upper and the lower points, okay, of that thermometer that has been given and a standard thermometer. So, um, yeah, it says that um, the upper fixed point for this thermometer is 210, okay, 210. The lower fixed point is going to be zero, okay. So we have 210 minus zero here. But in a standard mercury, like in a standard mercury in glass thermometer, the upper fixed point is 100, okay, minus is zero. So we have, you can see that both of these are on the same side, like at the denominator on both sides. Then we now take that given temperature, okay, that temperature that we've been given, all right, um, so we are, this is going to be, there's something missing here, and that is this 49 in the question. So this is supposed to be 210 millimeter and 49. Okay, so we are going to have, then we now take the lower fixed point, which is that 49 minus 0, okay, equals then in bracket x minus 0. So when we cross multiply here, Okay, when we cross multiply, this is going to be 49 over 210. This will be x over 100. So when you cross multiply, you have 49 times 100 is equal to x times 210. And this will then be 210x. This one will be 210x. 49 times 100 is 4900. And when we divide both sides by 210, we have 23.33 degrees Celsius. 
Next on its calorimetry, it is supplied uniformly at the rate of 100 watts to a 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 2 kilogram of a liquid for 20 seconds. If the temperature of the liquid rises by 5 degrees Celsius, then the specific heat capacity of the liquid is. Alright, so um, we know that quantity of heat, okay, there are many formulas that we use. Alright, one is power times time. Power times time. That is, if the heat is supplied by an electrical device, let's say you are using an heater, for example, to heat water. You say that the quantity of heat that is supplied to that water is equal to the electrical power, okay? The electrical power of that um, ether times the time that it took, okay, for the, I mean, for that usage. Another formula that we also use is the specific heat capacity is equal to mass of the substance that is heated, that is being heated, times the specific heat capacity of that substance times the change in temperature of the substance or the rise in its temperature. And it could be a decrease. Now, uh, usually it is a rise because you are supplying it. So that means that we can now, since Q, okay, Q here is PT and Q here is MC delta theta, we can equate these two formulas together. That is, you can say that MC delta theta is equal to PT. Okay. Now your mass M is here. From here, from the question, we have 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 2 kilogram. So we are going to substitute that here. Then times the specific heat capacity C. Then times the change in temperature. And if you look at the question, it says if the temperature of the liquid rises by 5 degrees Celsius, that is changes by 5 degrees Celsius. So we've been given that change directly. So we have 5. Then this is equal to the power, the power getting of that eta, which is 100, multiplied by um, the time, which is 20. Okay, 20 seconds. So now 5 times this one here will come 5 times 10 to the power minus 2 times C is equal to. Um, 2000. Then we divide both sides by this to get this value of our C here. We divide both sides by 5 times 10 to the power minus 2. So when we divide both sides by 5 times 10 to the power minus 2, we are going to have this 2000 divided by 5 is 400. Then times. Now, this, remember that this is at the denominator of this fraction together with this 5. So once it comes to the numerator now, this negative sign here is going to change. So this becomes times 10 to the power 2. Okay, it becomes times 10 raised to power 2. So this will then be equal to. Now this 400 will mean 4 times 100. 4 times 100. And that 100, we can write it as 10 raised to power 2. Okay, 100 is, I mean, 10 raised to power 2, meaning 10 times 10. So then we can now use the law of indices on these two. This is the reason why we have actually written this. Instead of writing that 100, we wrote it as 10 raised to power 2. So that we can now use the law of indices. Okay, so we can say, okay, since the base is the same, so we have 10, 10 years. Since the base is the same, we just take that common base. Then we add the power. Since this is multiplication, we have multiplication here. So we're going to have 10 raised to the power 2 plus 2. We we'll just leave this 4 as it is like that. So we have 4 times. Then we use the this is on this 2. So we have 10 raised to the power 2 plus 2. And this will give us 4 times 10 raised to the power 4. Okay. Joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. It could also be in per Kelvin. This doesn't change anything. There's no need for conversion here. Because the scale of the Celsius um, the, or, um, this, um, the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale, they have the same interval. Okay, so whether you are writing this as joules per kilogram per degree Celsius or as joules per kilogram per Kelvin, as you have in the option, it is the same thing. Okay, so we have four times ten raised to power four joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Okay, note the unit here: joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Next, two drivers G and H are at depth 20 meter and 40 meter respectively above the water surface in a lake. The pressure on G is P1 while the pressure on H is P2. If the atmospheric pressure is equivalent to 10 meter square of um, water, then the value of P2 to P1, that is P2 ratio P1 or P2 over P1 is Alright, so pressure varies okay directly as height or depth. Okay, the pressure in a liquid mm -hmm. varies directly as the depth of that liquid, meaning the deeper you go, um, the lower you go inside liquid, that liquid, the greater the pressure. Okay, the greater the pressure. So the pressure at the bottom of that container containing the liquid is going to be greater than at any other part above it. So um, we can take the ratio of their height. 
since the density and everything is the same thing, it's the same thing. The deficit density is the same thing, and the ascension due to gravity is the same thing. We are supposed to say, okay, pressure is equal to H O G, that is height times density times G. But we know that the density and the value of the G is the same thing. So instead of doing that, we just take the ratio of the height. Okay, we just take the ratio of the height. So remember that this is P two to P one. Okay, so this is like um say this is like h1 and this is h2 so we just take like h2 to h1 so you have 40 over 20 and that is 2.0 next so we have a diagram here and it's easy to answer the question it says the figure above represents a block and tackle pulley system on which an effort of w newton an effort of w newton supports a load of 120 newton as we have here if the efficiency of the machine is 40 percent then the value of w is Okay, so um, the velocity ratio of a pulley of a pulley system in a pulley system is equal to the number of pulleys that you have in that system. Now, if you look at this pulley system here, we have three pulleys: one, two, three, four, five, six. There are three pulleys here. I mean, sorry, six pulleys. Excuse me, six pulleys. So the velocity ratio here is six. Okay, and the load here is 120 newton. The effort is um, W newton, which is what we have to calculate the value of that W. Now the formula for mechanical advantage is load over effort. Okay, load over effort. We are supposed to use this formula here to get the value of the effort. Okay, that W. However, in the question we only have load. We don't have mechanical advantage, right? So what are we going to do? We then recall that there is another formula. There is a formula, okay, that we have a machine for efficiency. That the efficiency of the machine is equal to mechanical advantage over velocity ratio times 100 percent and if you look at this formula you've been given everything in this formula except for the mechanical advantage they've given us efficiency from the question as 40 percent we've gotten the velocity ratio by just counting the number of pulleys here okay now the only thing we can we have here is this mechanical advantage that we don't know so what are we going to do let us find the value of our mechanical advantage here first after we've gotten it we can now come back to use this formula here okay so now what we've done is instead of basically looking for ma we simply put here mechanical advantage is load over effort abby and the load from the question is 120 newton so we have 120 over e the effort the effort here has been represented as w that is that's force w so instead of using e i'm going to use w here okay now here that you have a mechanical advantage in this formula we are now replacing it with 120 over w okay so efficiency is 40 percent 40 equal to 120 over w that's a mechanical advantage okay over the velocity ratio which is six times 100 percent okay now when you do 120 divided by this it's like the same thing as dividing this 120 by six okay because this one is at the denominator and this one is still at the denominator okay so we are going to have 120 divided by 6 and that will give you 20 over w every other thing still remains as it is now from here so this is 20 over w times 100 okay 20 over w times 100 so you can now multiply the numerators like 20 times 100 okay so we have 2000 over w so we have 40 is equal to 2000 over w then when we cross multiply remember that this is like 40 over 1 and this is 2000 over w i really recommend that you write this thing out so that you can view it um very well because this what we've used there is like in line okay and um, in subsequent recording we are going to try to you know change that so because what we use here is, is in line it might be difficult to really picture um what is happening there so um maybe i should attempt to write this let's see if i can so what i'm saying is that here what we have is um we have 40 okay 40 over 1 is equal to 2000 you have 2000 over w apologize for the ink okay so you are now cross multiplying meaning this will now multiply this one here this will multiply this here and this one here is going to multiply this one here so you are going to have 40 times w and this will be 40 w and 1 times 2000 which will be 2000 so now I get the value of our w we are going to divide both sides by 40 so divide this side by 40 okay that is 40 
um, W divided by 40 you divide the other side too by 40 so you have 2000 apologize for the ink divided by 40 so we have this 40 cancels this 40 here yeah? and then 40 in 2000 is 50 so the f40 which has been as w here is um 50. next question on matter um in an experiment in which molten naphthalene is allowed to cool the cooling curve in the feature in the figure was obtained the temperature 80 degrees celsius is known as that is this temperature where you have the line or the curve parallel to the time axis here is known as so that part there is what we call the melting point okay it's called the melting point or the freezing point i mean this is the point where if this temperature keeps reducing okay this thing here is melting we say that it is melting meaning it is coming it is becoming you know like a liquid but if the temperature keeps um so if it keeps going down if, ke if it keeps increasing then we say that it is um so if it increases it is melting sorry um, pardon me if it is increasing it is melting okay because melting happens with increasing temperature but if the temp if it keeps going down then that means it's freezing but this point here is what we call the melting point okay so uh, you can see it in an, um, another diagram here okay for pure solid and for pure solid this is usually how it is the curve is usually like a straight line you have like straight line but for impure solid is usually a curve okay or generally for impure substances impure solids okay pure solids it is a curve but for pure solid it is like um direct like this like straight lines like this so basically that temperature is what we call the melting point you can also join our online tutorial classes for different classes we have tutorials for students in ss1 2 or 3 we also have for utme candidates for jam candidates for students who want to write a jam for the utm exam and for those who want to have the post utm exam after the utm exam and also for candidates that are sitting for waec exam or gce or neco and we offer this tutorial on various platforms so you could join us on whatsapp or on telegram you could be on zoom or on google classroom so we have various platforms where we take our tutorial the links to join the platform are available on our website at scholar.com or you could also check it out in the video description below next on electricity so the question is we have to calculate the value of r yeah the value of this resistance here so um the total resistance in the circuit re represented as rt okay so we have v is equal to i r t v meaning the potential difference which are given it as 12 volts is equal to i d um the current that is flowing in that circuit and that is 2 ampere okay this is an ammeter within 2 okay so we have 2 times the total resistance divide both side by 2 and your total resistance is going to be um 6 now let the effective resistance in parallel be rp that is for these two resistance that are in parallel they are going to have what we call an effective resistance let's represent that as rp okay so we are going to have rp plus now this effective resistance of these two here the effective resistance is now going to be in series with this one okay it will be in series with this one so the total resistance is going to be this one here three plus the effective resistance here which is rp it will be equal to the total resistance in the circuit which is this rt that we got here as six so i bring this here we collect our like times okay we bring three here this is plus three it comes and becomes minus three the effect resistance rp is going to be equal to three ohms then the next thing we are going to do is so that means that the effect of these two resistance here is three ohms we will now recall that when you have two resistors say r1 and r2 that are in parallel the effect resistance let's say the effect resistance represented as r okay then we say that that is equal to one it will be equal to um excuse me that will be one over r which will be like the effective resistance is equal to one over r1 okay one over r1 i apologize for the ink plus one over r2 okay so this r is the effective resistance which is what we calculated here as t 
okay and this r let's say this is our r1 this one here is our r1 plus one over let your r2 be this one that we have here okay now what we are going to do here is collect like times you bring this one here so when you bring you know this is plus here when it comes here it becomes minus okay it becomes minus then you take the lcm you take the lcm of this if you take the lcm of three and six that will be six okay then you say what is three in six that is two times one this will be two here okay minus then um six in six is one times one that is one this is why you have this two over one then divided like over over six so two over one is equal to um so i mean two minus one that is one over six so one over r is now equal to one over six it's like saying you have one over r okay is equal to one over six like this so if you compare both sides of the equation one is one like one equivalent to one then i'm that this r here is equal to what is equal to six next on electricity the question is which of the following instruments consumes the highest current So what we need to do here basically is for these devices here, for these um, instruments here, we need to calculate for each of them the current, okay, that is consumed. Now what we have here is the voltage, okay, the voltage rating, and here is the power rating, the power and the voltage. Now, electrical power is equal to current times voltage, okay, that is P is equal to IV. Now if we make I the subject of the formula here, okay, and let me show you how this is done. So what we have is power P is equal to IV. Okay. If I want to make this I the subject of the formula, what I'm going to do is divide both sides here by V. Okay. Divide both sides by V. If I divide both sides by V, this V will cancel this V here. And so I'm going to have I is equal to P. Okay. The power over the voltage V. Now, so that's what I'm using for this. Okay. Now, for each device, we are going to calculate the um, the current using this formula: here. power, the power here, divided by the voltage. For the electrical ion, so the power is one kilo um, one kilo watt, and one kilowatt is one thousand watts. You can see all of the other ones are in watts. So uh, what I will do is convert this to watts as well, so we can have a balance here. Okay. So we have this as one thousand divided by the voltage which is 250 and that is 4 ampere so this electrical ion consumes 4 ampere electricity and 4 ampere and that's the current consumed for the television set is going to be 110 divided by 220 and that is 0 0.5 for the touch light we have 30 divided by 6 and that is 5 ampere for the motion eater we have 500 divided by 110 and that is 4.55 and if you look at all of this here 4 0 0.55 and 4.55 we say that 5 is the highest which means that the touch light uses the highest current next electromagnetism which of the following pairs is not part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is the um the beta ray and alpha rays okay the beta ray and alpha rays they are nuclear radiations they are not from the electromagnetic spectrum so the electromagnetic uh, magnetic spectrum the waves in it they are categorized or summarized as remi vox g that's like a mnemonic okay remi vox g where the r is the radio wave we have it here okay the m microwave i infrared ray v is visible or light ray u is ultraviolet or uv ray x is x-rays and g is gamma ray so you can see we have radio wave and gamma ray in the electromagnetic spectrum but what we do not have what is not part of it is the beta rays and alpha rays they are nuclear radiation next on nuclear um, physics a substance has a, has a half life of three minutes after six minutes the count rate was observed to be 400 what was its count rate at zero time now the first thing that i want us to um note here is what do we mean by half life okay so half life basically means the time that is going to take for a substance to decay to half of its original mass okay let's say that the mass of a substance originally is 1000 okay and that substance has an half life of 24 hours what that means is that after 24 hours that substance will decay to half of the original mass meaning that the new mass okay or the remaining mass or what will remain of that material is going to be 500 the material that was originally 1000 will now be what 
500 after 24 hours that is like its half-life now here yeah, they said that this substance in question has an half-life of you know three minutes the half-life is three minutes so the question is after six minutes the count rate is now what 400 so what was its count rate at zero time that is at the beginning so what we are going to do here is that now six minutes means two half-lives has passed for that substance okay two half-lives has passed so we are going to take those time back okay like take three minutes back and three minutes back now if after six minutes the count is 400 that means that three minutes before that time the count was what was double of this i hope this is clear it means it was double of this that's 400 times two that's 800 then three minutes before that again because this is six minutes three minutes before that the count rate was what was you know double what it was okay so three minutes before to begin with three minutes before it was twice this that is 400 times two that's 800 then three minutes before that it was even double again so that's two times 800 so you have 1600 next so the question is the equation represents it represents a better decay it is in a better decay than an election is released like this okay so this represents a better um, decay however we need to also look at we need to also consider some things it is possible that a nuclear reaction okay like this can be uh, you know uh both alpha and beta can be emitted okay but if you look at this okay the first point why we are saying this is a better decay is because we have an electron that is emitted here okay that is the first point the other thing is that if you look at the original you know the original um atom here the atomic number has increased by one the atomic mass does not change it is 150 150 but the atomic number has increased by one and you only have this in a beta decay okay if this was an alpha decay something this atomic mass would have changed it would have decreased it would decrease by four and the atomic number would decrease by two okay so because it's only the atomic number that has increased yeah, that means that this is only or purely a beta decay all right the last recording here is um we have the electromagnetic waves that are sensitive to temperature changes are those are the infrared rays okay it's transferred by radiation occurs via the infrared rays okay don't forget to check out our playlist we have different playlists we have for full solutions to UTM or jam questions and in physics chemistry and biology we also have for modular quizzes as well okay we'll also have a playlist for post -ME or post jam exam and also for crash courses in physics chemistry and biology so don't forget to check out our playlist for the available videos so that's it for this recording thank you very much for watching um, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Scholafedu. Okay, like and share our content and visit our website at scholar.com to practice the exam and modular quizzes for free. Thank you.